Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, welcome to this Future of Diplomacy event, the Future of U.S. Brazil Relations. My name is Renata Mereda. I'm a second year Master's of Public Policy student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Turning my class. We'll be a great this year. Um, I'm from Brazil, so very excited about this discussion. Uh, mainly working on climate policy, but also work doing work here at HTS with the WHO, which is the Women in Diplomacy, Development and Defense. So we work about the Future of Diplomacy Project. Um, so just some quick kind of announcements before we get started. We have some uh, virtual participants as well as uh, in-person ones. So just be aware that it's just being recorded. So maybe your image might appear, so just be aware of that. And, and we also may post this video on the Belfry Center's website. Uh, and while this event is on the record, we prohibit any attendance from you know, using the audio, audio visual, uh, visual recording, or participating in any part of this event. Uh, certainly without any prior written authorization, so just be aware of that. And I just wanted to quickly thank you, Ricardo, and then we have our room for Eric here, the manager of the Future of the Balance Project, who will introduce our panelists. All right, so I'm sure you all know a lot about him, but I'll just do a quick read out. Um, so Ricardo Zuniga is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and Special Envoy for the Northern Triangle in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Um, he's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, previously served as a Senior Diplomatic Fellow at the Woodrow with Wilson Center, Latin American Program. He served also as the Director of the International Student Management Office at the National Defense University in D.C., and also as a U.S. Consul General in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. He was a Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council from 2012 to 2015. Worked overseas in Mexico, Portugal, Cuba, and Spain. And domestically, he has served in the State Department's Office of Cuban Affairs, the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, and also the Nets Coaster by Uganda and Tanzania. He was born in Honduras and has a BA in Foreign Affairs and Latin American Studies from the University of Virginia. So very, very proud of the resident. And I'll pass it on to Eric, who's going to start and introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I think I have to move this a little up. Um, so we're so pleased to welcome this esteemed panel here. Um, so I'd like to introduce Nick Zimmerman, who's actually an HKS alumnus. Uh, I won't say what year. Uh, <laughs> he is currently a senior advisor to the Latin America American Programs Brazil Institute at the Witcher Wilson Center for Scholars. He previously served in the Obama administration in a variety of national security capacities as senior policy advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, White House National Security Council Director for Brazil, and in Southern Cone Affairs and Special Assistant in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and Western Hemisphere Affairs Country Director. So thank you for being here with us. And Hussein Kalbu is a member of the International Advisory Board of the Brazilian Center for International Relations, known as SEBI. He is editor-in-chief at Sebi Journal. He's a political scientist, professor of international relations, special, special advisor to Harvard's International Council and research scholar at Harvard. Between 2017 and 2018, he was special secretary for strategic affairs for Brazil, a member of the Council of Ministers of the Chamber of Foreign Trade and was the president of the Brazilian National Commission on Population Development. And he also was helping with the Lula campaign. So with that, I'd like to welcome our guests and welcome um, Mr. Zuniga to give some opening remarks. Thank, thank you very much, Erica, and thank you to the Belfer Center. Thanks to all of you for participating um, in person and, and virtually. Uh, this is uh, obviously a, a, a very important moment for the United States and Brazil as we uh, see a transition to a new government. And I, I wanted to just highlight a couple of issues. Uh, first, we uh, approach this issue and this relationship on a long-term trajectory and our relationship with Brazil as one that's global in nature, um, far beyond the very rich bilateral uh, relationship and connection, people to people connections, um, demonstrated amply, for example, in our education relationship, which is extremely important and was a big part of our work in Sao Paulo when I was there at the, cons at the consulate. Uh, the, the reality is that we encounter Brazil all over the world. And 
So uh, whether it's on issues at the UN, uh, on issues related to Africa development in the region, um, our relationship with, with China, Brazil is a key player in that global dialogue. And so our approach uh, is with Brazil in that context. Uh, and so uh, I mentioned this is a, a long standing relationship uh, and the, the importance that we place on Brazil is uh, also as one of the major democracies in the world, uh, one of the unifying aspects and there is a, obviously a great deal of geopolitical complexity in these relationships, shared and convergent interests and areas of division. We have one area that really unites our countries, and that's that the populations, the societies of both, have shared values, and that is not a throwaway term. These are societies that value openness, um, that uh, strive to deal with complex historical legacies, uh, but also that want democracy and they want to have a, the democracies that actually deliver uh, for their citizens. And in a world that is rapidly evolving, uh, that is facing a challenge and a competition between authoritarianism and, uh, uh, and liberalism, the reality is that it is crucial to have a partner like Brazil in the, in the, in the international scene uh, as well. In practical terms, what does this mean? Uh, we obviously are going to deal on the greatest issues of the day. Climate change is absolutely going to be a core component of our uh, relationship with uh, Brazil under any circumstances, but certainly with this uh, incoming government. Food security, Brazil as a major uh, uh, producer like the United States, uh, is a big part of the um, solution to what is probably going to be a, a ongoing challenges we deal with the interruptions, not just those caused by the pandemic and supply chain interruptions, but climate change as well, coming back to that theme. Uh, international peace and security. Brazil is a major multilateral player uh, and has a long legacy of involvement in not just peace processes, but in seeking multilateral solutions to some of the most complex security problems that we deal with uh, around the world. So Ukraine will figure uh, prominently in global discourse. We certainly uh, anticipate having um, a, uh, an ongoing dialogue uh, over uh, our efforts to uh, find a solution to that, uh, to that crisis, to Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, we also have a very significant regional agenda with uh, Brazil. And what we've seen is that Brazil has presented solutions in the past to what we see as probably the most enduring structural challenge to progress in the region, which is inequality uh, and the uh, lack of social mobility. On top of that, we have not just because of the pandemic, uh, but because of a, um, a series of long-term challenges in the Americas, a, a unfortunate uh, but very pervasive uh, sense in many countries that uh, governments are, have not been able to meet the demands and aspirations of populations. And so that has opened paths in some parts of the region to uh, populist or anti-democratic solutions. But more importantly, it's also left much, you know, vast sections of societies uh, feeling like they cannot make their lives at home, uh, which feeds into another phenomenon affecting the region and where Brazil will certainly be an important partner. And that is the largest mass migration in the history of the region. Uh, mostly uh, in terms of raw numbers, uh, the, because of the 6 million Venezuelans uh, who have left uh, their country in, uh, over the last decade, but uh, is true of many nationalities in affecting countries from Chile to the US Southwest border. So um, in that context, Brazil has, uh, as another nation of immigrants, uh, is also an important player uh, in uh, regional fora in terms of trying to find durable solutions. Uh, and that means using the uh, tools that perhaps have not been used fully in multilateral banking system, uh, but also uh, regional tools for uh, improving, for example, labor flows, finding practical solutions to these uh, movements, and also ensuring that protections are in place for the most vulnerable populations. We will absolutely work very closely with Brazil in that uh, area. 
Another area of, of clear convergence is this focus on middle class, uh, on, on the middle class as the part of society that um, needs to be not just shored up and reinforced, but a as a central core of our respective societies. Uh, and again, the Lula administration, uh, will, the incoming administration, uh, has a, a history of a focus on um, promoting social mobility. The Biden administration is very focused on that uh, as well, and we think that that has a very significant regional uh, aspect as well. And then finally, on uh, in terms of our regional uh, uh, work, democracy, uh, and in particular, where there is a possibility to um, uh, put countries on a, on a positive path, as might be the case in Venezuela, uh, we have a shared interest in seeing a democratic outcome, not just in Venezuela, but in other countries where um, there is uh, a pull towards authoritarianism uh, or um, uh, other problems related to governance that clearly are a precursor to durable solutions related to social development. Uh, and uh, finally, and on the bilateral sphere, we have a long and established history with Brazil uh, in uh, promoting people to people contact. Education, as I mentioned at the top, is a core part of that. It's not the only one. Uh, we very much look forward to working together and dealing in a, in a uh, collaborative way with the shared challenges. As I mentioned, we have uh, one of the things that brings us together is not just our, our view towards the future, but also the legacies of racism, the legacies of inequality that uh, we are, as uh, respective societies, have tried to deal with. And, and having a shared collaboration in that sphere um, is, is absolutely credible. And uh, obviously is a good complement to the very important economic relationship that exists between our countries. And at a time when in the United States, we're very focused on supply chains uh, and on uh, ensuring that our, our partners are successful economically, that certainly will be a, a part of our uh, relationship. We have a $75 billion trading relationship. Uh, and uh, we, we believe that there is ample for an expansion of that. Uh, so that's also going to be certainly part of our uh, dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much. You gave us such a comprehensive overview of almost everything. So we have trade, we have inequality and race, we have people to people relations, democracy, growth of the middle class, Ukraine, food security. So I'd like to ask Nick and Hussein to just briefly react to what you heard and uh, give us your thoughts. I'll start with Nick. Thank you, Erica. Again, it's just it's such a pleasure to be here, especially with these two. It's it's a it's a hard group to 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 keep up with, but I'll I'll do my best. And, you know, briefly, I think as Ricardo had just said, Ricardo covered a lot of ground and gave a very comprehensive overview. I've taken to saying throughout this year uh, in my punditry hat that the Brazilian election was the most important in the world this year, uh, and I think Ricardo articulated a lot of the reasons why, but when you're talking about a world that um, looks so different from um, what we were experiencing in, in geopolitics, international diplomacy, even just uh, a few years ago, and you're talking about um, a relationship between the second and fourth largest democracies in, in the world, and two players that have outsized influence and impact on the global climate change debate, on food security, on how we can address government inadequacies in restoring social mobility and restoring faith and confidence in, in government processes, it just doesn't get more, I think, essential uh, and critical than, than that, which is why I'm so grateful to the Developer Center of the Future of the Diplomacy Project for bringing us all together. Uh, I think there's a tendency to uh, focus on, on some of the traditional um, historic um, great powers, right? China and Russia and, and Europe. I think we all still live a bit in a, in a post-World War II order. But in reality, um, when we look at the future of diplomacy, what it's going to take to create, I think, better outcomes um, for our shared humanity, you can't have that conversation without Brazil and India and Mexico and, and the like. So I hope this is just the, the, the first of, of many such uh, discussions because the subject matter and the potential in this bilateral relationship merits it. Thank you again. Jose, let's not forget the leading role that Brazil played in creating the cheap money as well. So, same. Well, thank you, Erica, for the invitation. 
It's a great pleasure to be here with Nick and especially with Ricardo Zuniga, one of the brightest minds in Washington about Brazil, likely the top one, I would say. And uh, we hope to see you uh, as U.S. ambassador in Brazil in the future, who knows, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I would say Ricardo is, no one understands Brazil rather than Ricardo in Washington. Uh, deeply, he understands everything and every, uh, the intricacy of the Brazilian politics and how complex is it. Um, of course, and Ricardo portrayed in a very uh, interesting way the world order and the challenge that Brazil and U.S. will face in the next uh, few years. We are in a new world order, uh, different order, more, more fragmented, more complex, and more competitive. And that will require even more wisdom and more serenity from Brazil and U.S., either in the hemispheric context either in the world stage. That said, I think, um, first of all, and the most important to say that U.S. is an irreplaceable partner in any dimension we want to discuss. Ricardo said very well about the ties between people. Uh, I truly believe in that. I think we have, I don't know, the Brazilian diaspora overseas, something around 3 million people, 4 million people, at least half of them. Then here in the US, right? So there is more than my like political or geopolitical relation. The cultural dimension, uh, a circle dimension, there's a familiar dimension of it. So it's really important, no matter what, how I describe it as I agree, the replaceable partner, right? Of course, partners sometimes agrees, the agreement, the, the, the bilateral relation certainly has a step. And now, but most up than that. And we were always uh, uh, um, saying uh, keen to surpass all the demons in that relationship, right? Everybody remember the, the tension that has happened between the Marosef uh, administration and Obama's administration, but uh, we were past that. And just recently, both sides, and especially the pinching camp is having a uh, friend and uh, constructing an all the dialogue with the with the U.S. current administration that shows that maturity is also very important in the diplomatic dimension, right? Um, well, another aspect is important to understand, like uh, when we look to the global coalition or the PT coalition or the new framework that we would have in the government. It's not a homogeneous coalition, it's not a monolithic political group, right? So you have uh, different tendencies, you have different ways to tackle the US Brazil relations, you have different ways to tackle Brazil national interests in the world, right? But what is important, and I want to make the use of uh, Jack Swagner uh, in a certain meeting that we had at Basque in Washington, and he said, well, we have the angels and devils on both sides. So let's put the angels to work together. And I truly believe in that. So uh, there's a huge opportunity today, and especially dealing with the current scenario, to uh, start to build more Brazil US relations. And especially because we have a very community agenda more than before. I would say during the 2000, mostly US Brazil uh, discussion were about free trade agreement market, access to market, uh, explorers. And I think we left that in the past. I think today we have much more uh, strategic issues to discuss rather than just trade, right? Even uh, vis-a-vis the European regional security architecture or the, the uh, complexity of, of several aspects dealing with transnational organized crime in Latin America, and so on. So I think there's uh, this, this uh, new administration in Brazil and the current Biden administration, they have the opportunity to, not to relaunch the relation, but to bring up the relation to, uh, to a strategic uh, new level.
You mentioned Lula's coalition. I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the election and go into that in more depth. So you are directly involved in the election. You're campaigning all around the country. Uh, can you describe what the polarized climate on the ground was like in Brazil? Um, also, can you explain Lula's campaign strategy and how the divisive mass um, of, the, of the race contributed to the, the thin or margins um, in the end for the first and second round? And um, with protest ongoing over the results, how does Lula plan to govern a divided Brazil? Uh, well, a lot I, of questions. Yeah, you made seven questions in a large chapter. So, first of all, I think it's not different than what has happened here in the US. It's pretty much similar what has happened, Trump Biden, and much similar the challenges that Biden is facing. That will be the same challenges that Lula cannot face, right? With, with only one different aspect, there is big partisan system, there is plural partisan system, which made Lula challenge much more uh, uh, complex in that sense, right? Uh, here also, the, US, the, 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 the difference was very tiny as a result too. Uh, so regarding that, I think Lula so he started already to build a coalition for real by by exercising his friendliness, by trying to bring even the center right right wing uh, parties to his coalition, because he knows that to rebuild the country, you cannot rebuild it only with the left wing character, right? You need also the centers and right and somebody with what we call democratic right, right? So um, so that's first. Uh, I'm highly confident that it will bring a very balanced cabinet that represent this formation of coalition. Uh, yeah, he emphasized that, and I think he will move toward this direction. Second, uh, about the current situation in Brazil, I mean, uh, it was very predictable that was hard not going to recognize the election. You were saying that you're not going to recognize it. He said he only recognized, uh, uh, he only accepted his victory or nothing else. So, I mean, that were expected uh, from his side. Uh, we were expecting that he will challenge legally or rhetorically the results, but we also trust in our institution. We trust in the legal system, and the legal system has been very, uh, in, in, in a, in a Great in a great way. Um, about the protest, I mean, whatever the protest is, it's right to people to, to make any protest. They can go, they can protest as far as they do it peacefully, as far as they do it with uh, and based on the legal norms and the legal terms, right? So you can go, you can make whatever decision, but what you cannot do is a balance disorder, right? Uh, well, in those manifestation, this one thing is very tricky, is claiming to the return of the military regime. And that, accordingly to the our constitution, is, uh, is crime, right? So in this aspect, I think where you have the manifestation, I think it's fair enough, but where you have the manifestation claiming for the use of force and breaking uh, the constitutional law, that is crime, right? So that manifestation is not legitimate one, right? So that said, uh, let us go to the, to the third aspect of your question, right? So about the manifestation, about uh, the challenges to govern, right? Uh, and then about the internal dynamic of Lula's space. I mean, look to the Democrat, the, to, to the Democrats here in the US. You have like a, someone like President Biden, but perhaps more like the Senator Bernie Sanders, right? And you have others like uh, Henry Clinton. So you have different you know, current within the Democratic Party and even within the, the Republican Party. And that also happened in Brazil and that also happened within the Lula space, right? So you have the people who are more in here, much more conservative left wing here. You have people uh, that they uh, are uh, uh, more flexible and more pragmatic toward. Uh, toward uh, certain uh, aspects related to whatever human right or not too much uh, in that field. I mean, so 
uh, Lula Bay is, is, is a highly heterogeneous one, which that make it rich, but at the same time complex, right? And the uh, president has to deal with that, you know? It's that is the art of politics, how you manage to deal with all the type of elements within, within uh, your base. The matter of fact, I think President Lewis is an experienced politician. He was president for eight years. I mean, he ran for president for six times, right? So, I mean, uh, nobody better than him to know what, what is good, what is bad in terms of uh, of all. Jing with his own kind and being one becomes, you know, that pretty much well better than anyone because he has faced that in the past. I'd love to bring Nick in to give the U.S. view of the comparison between what's going on between Trump, Biden, Bolsonaro, and Lula. So over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hussein already spoke on the fact that there are some similar dynamics in, involved. And I have repeatedly over the last six or seven years been struck at for all of the countries, both countries, complexities and idiosyncrasies, how there's a through line and sort of macro political dynamics that mirror each other. I'll, I'll be more concrete. In, in 2016, as a U.S. citizen politically involved, um, uh, I was struck by the rise of fake news, misinformation, disinformation, whatever you want to call it, the use of social media platforms like Facebook and and the like um, to influence uh, political opinion in the run up to the 2016 election. Fast forward two years, 2018, Brazil, I'm on the ground. I observed the election for the Organization of American States. Very similar dynamic, both in terms of the rhetoric and discourse coming from some of the political actors, but also on social media with uh, a new wrinkle. This time, uh, it's WhatsApp. Um, that is, is really seeming to be you know, the center of, of, of the focus in, in, in Brazil in 2018. We come back to 2020, we all uh, experienced that messy transition. Erica just you know, asked the question about some of the messier elements in the transition uh, present right now with these protests in, in Brazil. And again, one can't help but uh, escape the, the, this feeling that in so many ways, um, what citizens in, in, in democracies are feeling and their frustrations and the way that they're processing information in Brazil and the United States, but I would argue probably in many other uh, major democracies, they're increase, they increasingly mirror each other. Um, and so again, to Hussein's point, I think the comparison that he made is, is, is the right one. When I look at what's happening in, in Brazil, I see the United States in 2021 and 2022. Um, I think these protests matter. I think the fact that uh, President Bolsonaro did not explicitly uh, concede or recognize the, the result while also authorizing a formal transition, um, these things matter uh, in terms of rhetoric, in terms of political organization and opposition. And we've seen that in the United States. The way that January 6th has been interpreted by certain political actors resonates and impacts our political body to this day and will continue to do so through 24. I expect the polarization uh, within Brazil in general and with respect to this election to similarly have an impact on how the country's uh, political discourse evolves uh, over the coming years uh, during the Lula government. I also agree with you saying that, that Lula is a very experienced and an able politician like Joe Biden is. That doesn't mean these problems go away. Uh, you do the best you can. And ultimately, I think today, sitting here, um, we have to be, I think, reflective and recognize that despite the trials and tribulations at the end of the day thus far, the democratic institutions in both of these countries have done their job. And it's never easy. Mr. Zuniga, in uh, the readout of President Biden's call with President-elect Lula, he called the elections free and fair. And I know President Bolsonaro is one of the last leaders to call President Biden when he was elected. So I'd love to know um, sort of what the Biden administration is thinking, what the U.S. government thinking is about the election in Brazil. 
and what the plan is for an event of a democratic rupture um, in like a January 6th type event. So I, I think it's really important first to outline that at, at all times, the United States was neutral regarding the outcome of the elections. Uh, that's that our respect for Brazilian democracy is such that, that it, it, it requires us to be neutral with regard to the outcome, as do our interests with Brazil, which transcend administrations uh, and are enduring and really rely on, uh, frankly, two very capable and professional, not just diplomatic services, but government administrations and government structures to maintain those relationships, regardless of the ups and downs at, at any particular moment. What we were while we were neutral as to the outcome, we were not neutral as to the form. Uh, and so from the beginning, we expressed our genuine belief that, as Nick mentioned, the democratic institutions and election systems uh, had proven themselves to deliver uh, not just a free and fair vote, but the an accurate representation of the desires of the Brazilian electorate. Uh, and the that is a that is both mechanical and cultural. Brazil is a democratic country. It has a democratic vocation. It has a it is a has a system that is uh, that truly reflects the opinions of voters. That is transparent uh, and that has proven accurate in the past. Which is why we, from the very beginning uh, of the campaign, when we um, engaged. And when we're asked about this, we're very clear that we are confident that the election system uh, was going to succeed as it had succeeded in the past. And that we believe that, uh, uh, that uh, everyone in Brazil should express confidence in the system that, has, that was proven. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, we, we believe, in fact, again, uh, as we said then, that the election was not just free and fair, but reflective of popular will. Uh, and we look forward to working with all of those elected uh, through that system. Thank you. Um, I have to say from an anecdotal level, I know a lot of Brazilian people in New York and I've been worried about the level of like sort of radicalization online through WhatsApp. And I don't think a lot, I think a, a lot of people don't believe that the election was free and fair and don't have faith in the institution. So I'm just expressing worry generally about, um, about that. Um, so, yeah, I think we're going to open it up to the floor. Uh, there's a mic there. So feel free to turn it on and ask your questions. Also, for people in the Zoom room, um, type your questions in the chat. I see we already have one. And a special hello to Natalie Colbert. She's our <laughs> executive director and friends with Nick. So thanks for being here, Natalie. She's on maternity leave. So Carl, would you like to go and ask a question? I have a question for policy of the Lula regime. Brazil is part of the BRIC group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Um, a group which was formed before the Ukraine war and before the American-Chinese rivalry was as pronounced as it is now. How do you see the future of Brazil's foreign policy under the Lula regime, given the fact that the Biden administration is trying to organize a coalition of the democratic countries against Russia and China at the moment, meaning um, uh, against two countries which are in the group where Brazil is a member of. So I think it's important to underscore here that um, we, again, believe that in general, um, Brazil and the United States as societies, not as governments, as societies, believe in a, a you know, desire a similar world, which is uh, open, democratic, and uh, creates opportunities where people can realize their aspirations within this open system. That means that our respective diplomatic services, their main job is to construct a world that allows for those systems to flourish. 
that's at the 30,000 foot level. All countries have obviously a very extreme, you know, uh, very complex relations for making that ideal uh, a reality. And we have complex relationships uh, all around. Within the BRICS, uh, in the past, Brazil has also taken on positions that are reflective of support for human rights. I think of the situation with Rwanda, Iran, for example, uh, during the uh, Dilma Rousseff administration, and that was a point of some contention, uh, particularly with regard to treatment of women. Um, it was a very clear and evident standing apart from other members of that entity. The BRICS, I don't believe, in our view, is that, that you know the the reality of Brazilian diplomacy is such that it doesn't define the totality of Brazilian interests by any sense. Uh, and we um, certainly um, believe that uh, Brazil is going to be, is supportive of uh, international law and a world order that is, uh, that opposes and works against um, issues like the invasion of Ukraine. There are many areas of convergence there. How we achieve that world might be part of where we have some differences that we navigate uh, with Brazil. We've done that successfully in the past. Uh, it, we also recognize that, as I said, both countries have complex relationships with other members of that, not just that group, uh, but other actors in the international community. Uh, in the case of Brazil and Russia, for instance, the important uh, commercial relationship that exists there is a, is a reality and one that we acknowledge. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, we, we believe uh, and have seen uh, that um, we can make, we together, when Brazil and the United States are together on a particular issue, uh, that that does add enormous strength to the argument at the international level, which makes it imperative for us to deal with these issues um, in a in a very direct and transparent way um, through diplomatic channels, we have enormous respect, as I said, for the professionalism and capacity of not just of the Brazilian diplomatic service, but Brazilian society as a whole. And so that is certainly an area where we intend to to focus our work. We this is this is the difficult work of diplomacy: separating the acute and tactical interests from the strategic ones, and trying to find a way to make them work together to, as I said, craft a world where our societies can be successful. Well, um, yeah, uh, uh, I want to highlight and clarify one important thing. It's sometimes very important to be precise with some words in order to not create misperception. Uh, there is no Lula's regime. There's no regime at all. Brazil's a democratic state. And Lula was just Elected, he's the elected president, and he's now in a compass of uh, the formation of the government with a proper coalition from uh, several bodies. So, um, when you use the word regime, sometimes this is uh, it's not accurate. Uh, that said, I think Brazil's foreign policy under uh, President Lula, no matter what, would have three important elements: respect for international law respect for human right, and uh, respect to the self-determination and sovereignty of independent states. So that has been uh, part of the Brazilian uh, foreign policy doctrine. Uh, only most of have violated that, but that has been historically part of our foreign policy doctrine, uh, and we will follow that no matter what. Regard to Russia and Ukraine, uh, what I would say it is, uh, even in Brazil, uh, either in the black camp, the right camp, center right, center left, there's no relative view about it, right? If you go to the uh, to, 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 to the um, uh, universities, you will find different perception about it. If you go to the private sector entrepreneur, you will find a, a different perception about uh, the war uh, in Europe, right? So... There is no holistic view in Brazil. What can we say about Los Camp and President Self? Uh, there is no consensus about which direction 
effectively we have to pursue. Uh, there's two different visions about it, and we have to arbitrate between those two different visions accordingly to the Brazilian national interests, right? Uh, but one thing I could assure you that the president himself, he has spoken several times about it, uh, about the importance and the respect of the international and uh, the respect of self-determination of independent states. And it's clear in this matter who's the invader and who's the invader, right? So there's, 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 we don't have to elaborate a lot about it. Uh, but in terms of play, I positive role. So sometimes that sometimes U.S. perhaps cannot play because it's part of the, of the conflict. Uh, perhaps Brazil could help without the Russian government or to convince the Russian allies that it's time to stop the war and to, uh, and to uh, start a very unfair negotiation. So, I mean, uh, Brazil tradition has been always uh, based on the, the peaceful solution of the controversies. And we are a country that we never endorsed any war either in the past nor in the present, and except if it is a legitimate war based on the United Nations security resolutions. I think Hussein and Ricardo covered it. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So President Ola, I believe, said that Ukraine was also at fault for the war in Russia. So. Um, so, okay. Uh, President Lula, I believe, did say that Ukraine was also at fault for the war. So, do you have any comment on that? If I have any comment on that, well, I, I didn't saw the president saying that, so I don't have much comment. So, I'm not in a position to correct what the candidate said, but it's, a, it's an important difference when you are a candidate, when you become president. So, you know, and I, I didn't saw what he said about it, but what I could say, that based on personal conversation, he doesn't agree with the use of violence, and he does not agree with the, with the war. And he, I remember last time we talked to the media, he said it's time to end the violence, right? That's what he said. So I am sick with this kind of words. Anyone else? Questions? Sure, I, I just have a question. The populations of Brazil and the U.S. seem to be very split down. And the question is, for the first time, people, friends in Brazil were afraid of saying what their political affiliation was, or they were going to vote for, for fear of violence in person. And I think here in the U.S., we just had a Thanksgiving, nice people get together, have political discussions. It's so bad that you know, online people have increased the animosity, but offline they're afraid of engaging. They don't want to talk to the other people at the Thanksgiving table here, and they're afraid of getting political violence in Brazil. So what are the tools to address that division that's 50-50 in both countries? Diplomacy seems to be the way that you talk to people when it's difficult to talk, so I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yes, I'm certainly diplomatic at our dinner table. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, actually, it's a really interesting question because uh, I, I'm here with a colleague, Nadia Jimenez, who uh, is our senior advisor for the Afro communities in the United States. We met with a different community where, in fact, uh, there was, you know, for a completely different scenario, but there was fear based on uh, talking openly around the same, because of the same kind of social division and polarization. And uh, look, it, it just brings terms. Every country and every society and every community has to find ways to bridge that. We agree that, that, uh, that those internal tensions are really part of a global phenomenon. Really, this is, this is happening in so many democratic societies in particular. Uh, and the the forum is different. You mentioned the online component. That's certainly one aspect. It's also true that broad frustration with 
the um, related to you know, the broad effects of globalization, the difficulty that governments had encountered, particularly you know, not just in the Americas, of meeting the aspirations of people has created is, is a contributor to all of that. And um, I think that it it really requires us to talk about rule of law uh, and also political culture in ways that we have not typically done in uh, the last three or four decades. But it really is about political culture and what politics is supposed to do. Like how is it supposed to solve problems for people? Uh, and the uh, that's a very real issue in most of the Western world, including in the Americas. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think that um, there have to be places where people can have a civil discourse. That is the only way that we preserve democratic societies. There must be a possibility of debating different solutions to social, economic, and security problems. If those don't exist, then that minimizes and eventually severely corrodes democracy itself. And regardless of the country, and here I can only speak for the United States, and I, I don't, you know, I do this in, uh, as to my personal capacity, I think that uh, uh, the idea that you can have diversity of view and experience and deal with those differences in a uh, structured and civil way, where either through elections or at the community level, that is something that has to be a very important part of our of our political message as well. And that's something that voters can insist upon. You know, there's no, I think if any of us had the magical solution, right, for disinformation, misinformation, fake news, and polarization, you know, probably none of us would be uh, in this room at, at, at this time. And, and it, it's really tricky. I, I come back to, again, I'm not really speaking now as a, as a policy analyst, or, uh, but as someone who's worked on a number of campaigns, and a student of history, um, aided by by professors such as Professor Kaiser, my in, in my past, uh, there have been moments of deep division, polarization, and they're usually accompanied by populism. When there's a feeling more broadly the zeitgeist in the world that uh, governance isn't delivering any kind of, of governance, that the systems, the 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 way that we've structured ourselves as as nation states is is eroding. It doesn't, it doesn't smell right. Um, there isn't a sense of a social compact or contract that is delivering um, at the level that, that it needs to. That populist message is intrinsically more appealing, right? Um, we've seen it in the past. And we've also seen that ebb and flow. I mean, we've seen populism come to die. Why? The very reason why a lot of people who push those positions are able to rise power so quickly is the very same reason why you, you see them ultimately leaving in some form of disgrace or, or discredit. If it was that easy to get done, so many popular populist policies, a lot of other folks would have done it by now. And so I think it comes back to, yes, what we have been talking in this particular conversation in the U.S.-Brazil context of how can we work together and individually and with other countries uh, to take some of that frustration, alienation out. Is that a panacea? No, I do think it's a necessary precondition. Um, we have to figure out how to do government service delivery better. Um, I fundamentally believe, recurring me at this point, I, I, I think it's a great point. I also think it can be applied um, certainly to a number of other countries in addition to Brazil in terms of its similarity with uh, the United States. At the end of the day, you know, most people... You know, they don't want to have to worry about where they're going to find their next meal. If they're sick, they want to be able to see a competent doctor. They want to be able to spend some time with their family and friends, you know, on the weekends and, and, and during their holidays. We have systematically, I think, failed to deliver that reality to enough people. If you do deliver that, I think that some of the problems that we've seen, I, I don't believe that fake news goes away. I don't know what to do about social media either. Uh, you'll start to see different different outcomes. That, that's my hope anyway. And in terms of what one can do in their day to day, it's what I choose to focus on because I see no other way to make an improvement. Well, you guys has, has covered all, but uh, Jason, you know very well uh, that the uh, radicalization and extremism are so much 
was a lot in the last four years. And that has been a state policy led by Moscow to radicalize and to increase extremism. And, and of course, the level of ignorance is, helps a lot on spreading them. So in the media, how a lot contributed to spreading noise across the country, right? So if you go to the south of the country or other places in the country, people believe that Brazil will become a common state. And then they really believe that uh, uh, some audience is going to come to Brazil and then they're going to make a recount and they're going to prove that Bolsonaro had won the election. I mean, so the level of importance is, 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 is really um, astonishing, and especially uh, social media uh, facilitated that for good and for bad, good information, but also bad information, right? Uh, how we combat that? Well, education is first, second, regulation, right? And uh, third, uh, the belief in the institutions. I mean, uh, uh, there's no other way to do, right? Uh, and um, I don't see things pretty much different than what has happened here, January 6th or whatever. I mean, uh, even in Brazil, when you look to like Nazi fascist group right now, right? Enough, right? Even recently, you know, uh, so that's something we have never had faced in the country, at least in the last since I would say the 80s, but now we are witnessing that. That is really pretty much dangerous. So um, there's no magic solution, I mean, to that, just uh, education, time, and regulation. On that note, I know that Bolsonaro's son went to Mar a Lago to meet with the President Trump's advisors, Steve Bannon, and others, and um, they're starting to use the whole free speech. Uh, language. So that's an added added element to all of this discussion. Any more questions in the room? Please. Thank you for this discussion. I'd like to pitch a little bit um, on another issue, especially uh, cooperation on organized crime uh, among countries, and especially among uh, uh, Brazil and US. Uh, we have basically the best uh, cooperation uh, or we have faced, we're facing uh, definitely problems of uh, organized crime in Brazil these days, of many kinds and violence of many kinds. And the problems in America, the drug issue is a big issue, uh, and uh, it has a lot to do with relations uh, with the United States. It's, it's the main uh, drug consumer market uh, for, for drug producing in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, and we're now facing a uh, change in uh, American politics internally uh, regarding legalization of uh, some drugs for recreational use as well. So how do you see the possibilities of changing the policy, not only internally, but also to the hemisphere, so we can somehow uh, stop this drive for uh, sort of violence in Latin America? Should we take a second question? It was among the similar items, so thank you. Uh, so I think, first of all, it's important to point out that uh, the Biden administration has approached, has approached the issue of uh, drug use as a, as a health uh, issue. Uh, and certainly there's a law enforcement component that you can't uh, eliminate, but it is a health issue when it involves addiction and it involves the drugs that are truly disrupting societies. Uh, fentanyl in the United States, of course, is a big threat in terms of health uh, and if you drive through the United States and you see that there are billboards encouraging people to have drugs that they have you know, a, uh, uh, drugs that, that help turn, you know, help save people who are uh, experiencing a, an overdose. That tells you about the scope of the challenge in the United States. I, I would separate that a little bit from the um, issue of organized crime uh, because I agree. And when I was Consul General of Sao Paulo, one thing that really concerned us was the rise in power of the PSC. Uh And that was a, and, and the reason it was such a phenomenon of importance is because what Brazil has is, is a very capable federal police, it has judiciary, it has a national system that has prevented in many ways the kinds of organized crime 
national level organized crime groups that affected so many other parts of, of, of the region. And what we saw was that the PCC was gaining control of the flow of cocaine into uh, uh, not just Brazil, but then when it was exported from the ports, that became a massive source of revenue as well. It was armed, it was international already by that point with operations in Bolivia, Paraguay. Uh, and it was a cause for concern that we work very actively with counterparts, not just at the national level, but also in our case in Sao Paulo, with the Sao Paulo authorities as they work with other states and internationally to try to counter that uh, phenomenon. And uh, one thing that we see uh, is that, and it was demonstrated with this mass migration flow as well, so that organized crime groups are, they're, they're opportunistic and they will take advantage of, of whatever product happens to be selling in that moment, whether it's transport of people or goods, trafficking in people is certainly a huge problem uh, everywhere, uh, or drugs, which have made such a huge uh, part of their revenue and, o- over years. That, uh, again, the emphasis has to be on cooperation on judicial cooperation, on sharing information, uh, in particular, on sharing information. Um, That's been an important part of our work, including with the the current Brazilian government, past Brazilian governments. We believe that um, um, the other challenge is that the region is also beginning to experience addiction uh, in levels comparable to what you've seen in the United States, not just with cocaine, but also with fentanyl and in other parts of the of the region, uh, and so the public health component and the, the trying to not demonize users or addicts, but rather treat them, is a public policy challenge everywhere. Because the same stigma uh, that exists in the United States with regard to drug use and particularly drug addiction exists everywhere in, in the region. And yet, there's no way you can solve it uh, without th- treating it as a public health. Uh, concern, um, while you also find practical ways to deal with the you know, changing social norms uh, around uh, drug use. That should not detract from the fact that we also believe that we should do everything we can to reduce the revenues of criminal organizations that unfortunately have become uh, very powerful uh, across the uh, across the region. So uh, they are related, but somewhat distinct uh, matters in our, in our view. Any other questions? Please. Okay, thank you. So I live on a day-to-day basis, a dispute between Bolsonaro and Lula. I went to Brazil in 1965 the Cornell Exchange Program and work with Belmel de Camara in the Sifi. So that's like 55 years ago. My wife's from Bahia. Her sister went underground during the dictatorship and had to go to Chile when Allende was president to seek political asylum. When Figueiredo became president, he gave, a, he gave amnesty to people who had left Brazil. When Paulo Freire would come to lecture here in Cambridge, he and his wife, Donna Elza, would come to our house for Dejuad in the 80s. That's one side of the thing. <laughs> she has a niece who is a doctor by Bahia. She went to work in the rural areas of Bahia with other doctors. In five months, they, they, um, they never got paid. The, the government said, we don't have the money. Then Lula went to Cuba, and he contracted Cuban doctors to come to Brazil pay the Cuban government in dollars that eventually went to pay for the doctors. So her, my wife's brother on the other side of the family is totally in favor of Bolsonaro because if they couldn't find money to pay their daughter, but they could go to Cuba to pay, to pay um, Cuban doctors. So this young lady, this doctor, who's my niece, is now the mass general as a neurologist. And her family is all Bolsonaro. The other side of the family is all Lula. So, um, and I, I listened to the, the dialogue on both sides of the family. We employ Brazilians from Minas Gerais for landscaping, house cleaning, 
and painting and masonry. They're all for Bolsonaro. And my wife at the table, when they had the primary election here, it was in Malden, almost all the immigrants that came to vote were for Bolsonaro. Now, this is my point of view. Bolsonaro, four years ago, won by a margin of 10 million votes. Biden won by a margin of 7 million votes. My, my impression is the Brazilians did not vote for Bolsonaro because they had no idea who he was, but they rejected the Workers' Party of Lula. And now they're back to the Lula's Workers' Party. And how it plays out, I have no idea. So I just want to give you my personal observation no, on the day of the day. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. I have to say, I voted in Malden. Yeah. And um, it was my first time voting in a Brazilian election. And I was so surprised that people were wearing their colors. I, Bolsonaro shirts, right? It overwhelming. The immigrants all wore Bolsonaro. Yeah. And I, this is anecdotal, but I heard that in the, oversight, in the overseas election, there was voting in the West Bank in Israel, and they all voted for Lula. And in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, they all voted for Bolsonaro. Behind you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'd like to make one question. You talked about how the U.S. and Brazil already have very strong relationships in different areas related to trade, to people coming to study. And I'd like to listen to your perspective on what are the room for improvement? What, in what areas do you think that our co cooperation between the countries can improve, especially in the areas related to economic development, so related to trade restrictions and also mobility of people. I'd like to listen to your perspective on, on this. Well, I think, uh, uh, do you want to do a second question? One more. Just building on Vinicius' question. Uh, first of all, thanks to Carlo. I mean, uh, U.S. Uh, position in Brazilian elections were, was very important for us as Brazilians. Uh, and building on his question, uh, Lula's speech in, in Egypt uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, he demanded more action and also more funding from uh, developed countries uh, regarding climate action. And um, what do you see uh, as opportunities for cooperation uh, on the cigar and climate? You could leave it there. So, <laughs> so, uh, so let me start with the second question, and then uh, because I think that they they are very related. Uh, I think that with regard to climate action, one thing that the United States says that the Biden administration is focused on is dealing with uh, a, a long-standing problem in the multilateral banks, which is that middle-income countries are constrained from gaining access to resources because the, the very strong focus of the banks historically since, the, since really the end of the Second World War has been on poverty alleviation and on dealing with those who are most left out of society. And now um, many national governments have systems in place or you know, social security systems in place and the challenges that the multilateral banking system could resolve have more to do with the ability to confront climate change, deal with communities that are um, burdened by uh, mass migration, which is another feature of the global community at the moment, uh, and also positioning countries to uh, take advantage of um, potentially moving up the value chain in terms of their economic relationships with other, other countries. What that means is making investments in infrastructure, making investments in human capital, in humans, in education, uh, and in social welfare that enable people to actually um, enter into industries that are going to move them up, they're going to give them greater social mobility. Uh, and there we believe that the, this issue of supply chains, there's a very natural and large opportunity in that sphere, given human capacity in Brazil, one thing I saw in Sao Paulo was enormous energy around, um, uh, you know, certainly in the finance sector, but also in terms of production and innovation. There is enormous potential in, in Brazil. One thing that we found, for instance, was that many innovators in Brazil sometimes 
felt they had to go elsewhere to copyright uh, their products for even for use in Brazilian markets because one of the challenges was uh, administrative, right? It was difficult to operate. And there are many, many areas where um, we can collaborate, for example, on uh, this. Some of this sounds boring, but the boring stuff really matters. The on regulatory collaboration, uh, we had a history of collaboration between um, the Office of Management and Budget and uh, uh, an office called OIRA, which does regulatory uh, oversight, uh, and Casa Civil in, in Brazil, where we think about how, because we deal with similar challenges, overlapping laws, overlapping regulations, getting our, uh, you know, aligning policies to take advantage and being nimble enough to take advantage of economic opportunities that might be emerging that we're not really designed to, to you know, take advantage of. And you know, what we find is there's enormous readiness, both at the national level in Brazil and at the state and municipal level as well, to use those relationships. And what we see is that this greater connectivity, um, particularly at, at, you know, the United States is going to be hosting this um, uh, Cities of the Americas Summit in Denver in April, because so much of the work that's, that is, like democracy is felt most at the municipal level and delivered most at the municipal level. And in highly urbanized countries like the United States, Brazil, that's really where democracy exists for most citizens. And I, that's where most of the innovation is taking place as well. So in these subnational relationships, that's another area where there's enormous uh, room for um, expanded uh, relations. Education, there's always more. We think we have a very good relationship with Brazil right now. I mean, there's 15,000 undergraduates from Brazil and the United States. Uh, but there's tons of room for that. I, I can tell you my own daughters are very eager to do exchange programs in Brazil as part of their university education. I think this is they these are this is a very natural connection um, that we could do uh, more to exploit. So uh, I think you'll see that I focused on at some extent on the the national government relationships, but I think a lot of that is it's below that level that you have the most energy in the relationship between the two countries and the most room for potential expansion. I would just add, uh, to, to use an expression uh, that was very popular when uh, Ricardo and I were both at, at, at the White House, just to put a blanket term over it, there's a lot that has been done between Brazil and the United States, and that can still be done on trade facilitation, which is the, which is the wonky, nerdy expression for trade arrangements that don't involve tariffs. Regulations are a great one, but simply just streamlining, hey, we do it this way, we do it that way, it can cut down on import export times. There's a lot of, as he said, you know, non-sexy stuff, um, but it, it's been a feature of the bilateral agenda, no matter who's in power in both countries uh, in, in recent times. I, I do think it adds up. I wanted to just quickly comment, uh, I didn't get your name, but on climate action. Um, I'm sorry, what? Silas. Silas. That's it. Um, we are lacking. I mean, I, I'm a private citizen in the United States. I, I, I think developed economies of the world is very clear in Egypt. Uh, I thought Lula was was completely within his right to say that he was there also in parts of even Cobra to, to, to cover. We need it. I mean, climate finance is a huge problem. It's much bigger than the United States. Uh, the United States has a huge role, I think, to play in it. Um, I, having spent eight years in the government, I can't say that... Um, I'm usually uh, a glass half full uh, type of person, but actually I am more optimistic and energized about uh, this space and specifically the U.S. Brazil than, than I have been since I, I worked on these issues from the White House in 2014, 2015. There's a lot of interesting things going on in Washington. Um, I talked about this a little bit during the breakfast that, that, that we just had. Ricardo just mentioned one of them um, with multilateral development being um, changes, uh, and middle income status. Um, but, uh, if you believe recent reports, uh, our special envoy, John Kerry, he did just meet with president Lula, according to Brazilian media, they've discussed, uh, the U S government's direct participation in the Amazon fund, the sovereign fund that was set up by Germany and, and, and Norway, whether or not that report is true, accurate, or just a mere possibility, and whether it becomes an Amazon fund type of contribution or, or, you know, something else. Uh, to me, that is a, that's a change in, in the conversation from years past. 
There was also a lot of interesting things happening on the Hill. I, I'd like to make sure in, in as many of these events that I participate in that I highlight the importance of initiatives like the Amazon 21 Act. Uh, this is essentially the bill that is trying to make good on President Biden's pledge uh, to bring climate finance to bear in, in globally significant uh, forests in the world. So again, it's not from sales specific, but a big chunk of this bill, if I'm not mistaken, again, it could be amended, We'll have to see if it passes. Talking about four point five billion through fiscal year twenty thirty. So if you just do some back of the envelope math, that's seven or eight hundred million dollars a year were it to be approved tomorrow, which which it won't. That's essentially a new Amazon fund, right? Um, in terms of bringing direct climate finance to bear, um, Lula and and his team, like you're saying, uh, recognizing and making this one of the the critical uh, foreign policy issues. Um, I also think just becomes a catalyst in and of itself. And my hope and my expectation, guys, uh, is that the two countries can work together on this for the broader basin writ large. And then how uh, the sustainability debate has also impacted democratic erosion, has also the lack of social mobility has also contributed to migration. It goes beyond the basin, um, right? It goes all the way up. And I think there's an opportunity here for Brazil and the United States to lead in a way that would not only potentially be a game changer in the region, but it could really be, I think, a template and a model for the rest of the world uh, to look at because this is a problem that isn't going away and is truly global in nature. Sorry, I'm going too long, but as maybe you can tell, I'm kind of passionate about this one. No more thoughts on (laughs) the African or Yeah, no, no. Have yeah, covered it all. Um, well, I mean, basically, room to improvement, right? I mean, like, climate change definitely is one of the main aspects, bullying of people, migration, technology, education, uh, training facilities, all those elements, I mean, um, will be on the end, I, I think so, between both sides. So, of course, there's a room to improve it, definitely. Well, I think on that, we're at time, and that's a hopeful note to end on, I think. Unless we want any more parting words, sisters and you guys. Look, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much. I think you, 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 what you saw here is I see a picture of uh, a, an intent to work uh, collaboratively with uh, Brazil, our deep respect for Brazil across administrations, our enduring relationship because we view our interests as being so more aligned now than uh, even in the, it, it was case in the past. And because we have so many of the shared challenges and the same things that our societies have to work through really are real in both countries. And so I think that um, we just have enormous respect and uh, desire to work closely with this uh, important international partner and, and fellow democracy. And uh, so, um, should also say we also have a, a fantastic nominee for an ambassador to uh, Brazil, Elizabeth Bagley, uh, and uh, we are um, we have fantastic teams as well in our respective services and across our governments who are committed to make this relationship um, work for our people. That's really our our role, our job, uh, and so I really thank the Belvedere Center, Erica. You've been great uh, as a moderator and. Um, I just appreciate the chance to have this conversation and thank you so much for the really great questions. Thank you all for being here.